I'm Emily Bellet and you're listening to The Wallet. And this is Banking Bad, six true crime stories from the world of money. Every Thursday for the next four weeks. If you enjoy the series, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We read every single one. If you're struggling with your pension, you're not alone. Luckily, Pension B is on a mission to help. Every month, join me, Philip Alam, with a panel of experts on the Pension Confident podcast as we tackle your personal finance questions. From how to talk to kids about money to how your relationship status impacts on your finances, it's all in the podcast. Available right now, wherever you like to get your podcasts. Just keep in mind, though, that anything we discuss should never be regarded as financial advice. And when investing, your capital is at risk. Greatest, greatest bubble, story, bubble story of all time. Tulip mania. We're used to hearing about stocks, credit or commodities being at the center of bubbles. Never a flower. But when Anne was at Harvard... My name's Anne Goldgar. She started doing research into the Netherlands. And I am a historian of early modern European cultural history. And she discovered a story about tulips, a strange chapter of Dutch history, when a single tulip bulb came to cost as much as a house. It became a story that's quoted time and time again. It's used as a warning when Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies, or speculative market crazes are discussed. It's even mentioned in movies. This is the greatest bubble story of all time. That's Gordon Gekko, the fictional villain from the movie Wall Street, who became a cultural symbol for greed. Back in the 1600s, the Dutch, they get speculation fever to the point that you could buy a beautiful house on a canal in Amsterdam for the price of one bulb. They called it tulip mania. But he's wrong. This is what really happened. At the start of the 17th century, the Netherlands was prospering. They had recently broken away from Spain and received many refugees from what is now modern-day Belgium. These people had big ideas about overseas trade. They had sophisticated taste in art and music. But then Anne made a strange connection. People who were buying art in Amsterdam were generally also buying tulip bulbs and tulips. There's a a very good reason for that, which is that the kinds of tastes that people who bought art had were echoed in an interest in things, generally things that were rare, different, exotic. Usually, the worth of an item would be determined by supply and demand or its intrinsic value, but sometimes an outside factor can come into play that messes with the whole system. In this case, a virus called tulip breaking virus, also known as tulip mosaic virus, swept over the tulip fields. It gradually weakened the bulb with each new generation and caused tulips to have different petal colors effects, such as stripes or flame on an otherwise single color flower. Imagine tulips with petals of red and white stripes that float out like ribbons of peppermint candy. Not knowing this was caused by a virus, Dutch society is fascinated by the novelty. People did want to speed it up if they could, and there were all kinds of ideas about how you could do it, like um, cutting a tulip bulb in half and and putting ink on it or or paint or something and then sticking it back together uh, with the idea that that might uh, change it. But then the word begins to spread. That meant that if there was that there was more demand among those who desired them, and then it's that started to attract attention. And so you already start to see, well, you start to see the prices going up a little bit at the end of the 16th century, but they're still relatively cheap. Wanting to get a piece of the action, new companies start to crop up, saying they'll bankroll tulip growers, and prices begin to climb rapidly. What we see in the 1620s is there starts to be more of a fascination with the fact that there are people who are fascinated by by tulips. So people start to talk about it. Um, In 1623, a man in The Hague named David Beck, who kept a diary, um, uh, started to talk actually in in the very first or second entry in his diary, which he was keeping after the death of his wife, says 
you know, there are people who are crazy about tulips. I just don't understand it. Um, in, in around the same time, there's a journalist who is writing a quarterly journal mainly about the Thirty Years' War, mainly about foreign policy. But in the midst of it, he starts to say, well, actually, the tulip, tulip is, are really gaining a lot of attention and saying, well, there's somebody in Amsterdam who has bred the most beautiful tulip called the Semper Augustus, which is the one that most people have heard of. But it was a beautiful red and white stripes tulip. And he has 12 of them and he won't sell them to anyone. And so at the end of the summer of 1636, tulip mania has officially begun. And one of the reasons for that is that there's a plague epidemic occurring. Some people have suggested that there was kind of a devil may care sort of attitude, the idea that, well, we're all going to die anyway, so we might as well spend our money on, on something that might make us money or what difference does it make? It's all a gamble and so on. I don't really see that in my archival work. It, it seems to me that despite the plague epidemic, that life is going on pretty much as normal. But what is happening, and I think this is relevant to the, the ability of people to buy tulips, is that because there are actually quite a lot of people dying, there's quite a lot of money circulating because people are inheriting money from the people that have died. But people really quite far down the social scale had money to invest in various things, in stocks and bonds, um, in um, uh, shares of the East India Company, in Um, art, many, many, many people owned art in a period p that you would think wouldn't have, but it was just a very common, uh, common uh, thing to buy. So luxury products were, were out there to buy, and this was one of them. As demand grows, so does the price. You start to get some tulips which are worth around a thousand guilders. A couple of years' wages of, of a upper level artisan or professional person. And a thousand guilders is the price of a sort of medium sized house. There was a period when people could simply exchange the bulbs by passing them from one person to another. But once you got to the autumn of 1636, it starts to be a different matter because the bulbs are not available to be passed. There was a belief that you had to uh, dig up the tulip bulbs in the summer and then bury them again in the ground in sort of September, October, leave them in the ground throughout the winter and spring. They would then come up and after they've come up and flowered, then you could dig them up again. The pattern that the trade takes is that you don't have to pay for the item until you receive it. So you make a promise to buy it um, and, you, and, then, and, and the price remains the same because you've made an agreement on the price. And what happens in the autumn of 1636 is that people really start to notice what's happening, but the tulips are in the ground. And so people will make an agreement to buy And that's when you start to see the lawsuits happening. And the lawsuits in the autumn of 1636 are all from people who wanted to buy and had made a promise to buy, but the seller has decided to throw that promise away and to sell to somebody else that can pay more. But around the 7th of February, 1637, things start to go wrong. No one really knows why, but the prices of tulip bulbs crash to nearly a tenth of what they were before. The problem is, people haven't actually paid for the bulbs yet. They had only promised to pay, so sellers are frantic. Sellers go to their buyers or have notaries go and threaten the buyers and say, well, you're supposed to pay me now. Where are you? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you buying your tulips? They know, of course, perfectly well why they're not there. And the notaries will go and get an answer. And the answer that they usually got was, I will do as another has done, meaning no one else is paying, so I'm not paying. And so they get upset and they get increasingly upset as we get to September when they have to bury the bulbs again because they still have them. But really, no one actually lost money. And only a few bulbs were as expensive as a house. It's just the sellers who were promised a lot of cash who had this grant. 
there's nothing they can really do. That might seem like an underwhelming end to the story, but it's what happens next that's interesting. People start talking about it. You can see it in other countries as well, that people notice it, especially travelers who have, who have come through. There are some people who write about it in letters. There is quite a bit written about it to make fun of the trade. The Netherlands in this period is a culture, but actually much of Europe in this period is a culture where people dramatize ridicule, um, where they'll sing songs making fun of people. They'll do little street theater to make fun of people. There's a lot of sort of public... Uh, shaming going on in all kinds of ways. And that's what happens at this time. So we actually have a lot of, of publications making fun of either individuals uh, that who are named who were involved in this and how stupid they are, how stupid the whole trade is, but also saying we're being punished. You know, the plague epidemic is punishing us for the fact that we have been spending our money on this kind of thing. You know, lots of things like that. But also also just saying the wrong people are buying tulips. It ought to only to be rich people who really understand what they're doing. We decided to cover this tulip mania because it's still in, in popular culture. When you think about the movie Wall Street with Gordon Gekko, um, you know, it's, it's talking about the, the tulip crash. And there's also actually another author, I think, Charles Mackay, who has also popularized the myth of, of tulip mania. I mean, what, what role did, did his like, storytelling play in, in perpetuating the, the narrative, do you think? His book was Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And it's very colorful. It's written in a very dramatic way. And there's all kinds of stuff which comes from some of these earlier accounts, but builds it up even more as a dramatic thing where people are committing suicide and, you know, jumping into canals or, you know, none of that stuff happened. And I think Mackay is probably the person who is the most guilty of uh, bringing up this myth. But the fact is that That myth is really is really uh, exciting, and it's very very difficult to wipe it away. You every if you if you Google tulip mania or you look up tulip mania on uh, on Twitter, and you will find that people are saying tulip mania about any kind of financial crisis or or controversy that happens, and generally echoing the same uh, the same tropes as before. So it's not surprising that it ends up in Wall Street. It's not surprising that, you know, a movie was made of, uh, um, of, of full of, of errors of the Deborah Maga book, Tool of Fever. People like that story. It's an exciting story. Um, and I know, I know that one economic historian, who's a friend of mine, said to me when I told him that I was working on this, said, you're never going to be able to convince people that it didn't happen that way because people don't want to let go of that. No, it's frustrating. <laughs> And and do you see uh, do you see any parallels that can be drawn between you know this historical phenomenon and, and how and, and and what happened after the tulip mania and the stories and the culture around it with maybe some you know what happens today around maybe you know meme stocks or in the stock market or Bitcoin or you know I think that it's very common for people to draw that parallel. It happens every time after the dot during the dot com bubble. A website was formed called itulip.com, which still exists, I believe, which was trying to give financial advice. Many people who want to uh, give financial advice, largely of the kind that you need to be careful what you speculate in, don't be stupid. Speculation is when people buy something like tulip bulbs or stocks, not because they need or value them but because they hope the price will go up and they can sell them for profit. It highlights how prices can become detached from their value. Don't do this if you don't understand what you're doing. Every time tulip mania is brought up again. I don't personally feel that there are lessons to be learned uh, from, from tulip mania and how it turned out. I think that anybody that does that doesn't understand the cultural and economics and social circumstances of the 1630s. While it's tempting to downplay the historical significance of tulip mania, the reality is that this story helps us understand our behavior as investors. As an individual retail investors, we face many challenges. In theory, we make 
rational investing decisions. But in practice, many things impact our behavior. One, greed and fear lead to irrational decisions. No one can predict the future and how markets will perform. And it's important to remind ourselves of this common saying in finance. The markets take the stairs up and the elevator down. It just gives you an idea at which market can seem to turn against you. Although as retail investors, we now have more access to investment information than ever, institutional investors still have an advantage. They have this edge where they will optimize their decision process with lots of analysis, where teams of professional research and analyze mountains of data. And two, after greed and fear, the collective psychology can influence our investment decisions. Sometimes our action can mirror those around us, and we incline to follow the crowd, the herd mentality, trusting others' judgment over our own. And when I look at today's landscape, 25% of 18 to 24-year-olds are seeking financial guidance on social media. We see the rise of social trading apps where you can follow how other investors are doing. And meme stock, these publicly traded companies whose stock prices are very volatile as a result of speculative trading. And these are making the temptation to trade hard to resist. This is why I still think that there are lessons to be learned from the famous tulips. Investing shouldn't be scary of course, and it's crucial to grow your long-term wealth. But it is also a good reminder for us to be careful about chasing after investments or assets solely based on the hope of quick wins. We've seen this time and time again, recently with cryptocurrencies. When you're taking more risk, understand that you should be ready to lose some money too. And to finish off, I'd love to share with you my 10 golden rules for investors. One, don't put all your eggs in a single investment. With diversification, you can spread your investments across different asset classes, stocks, bonds, real estate, cash, to reduce risk. Save, have an emergency fund, and repay expensive debts before you invest. Two, you need a plan with defined goals, how much risk you're willing to take, and your time horizon. When will you actually need the money? This will help you make rational decisions and avoid emotional trading. Three, Investing should be boring and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. Be patient and stay invested for the long term, usually five years plus, as it can help you ride out market volatility and benefit from compounding. Four, do your research and educate yourself. Never invest in something you don't understand and can't explain to people around you. Avoid blindly following speculative trends. Five, get to understand risk. Only invest money you can afford to lose. It's a tricky concept to grasp, but start small and see how you feel about market fluctuations. You can adjust risk based on your goals and the time you have until you actually need the money. It's also helpful to reframe risk as an opportunity. Six, don't follow the herd. Just because everyone else is investing in a particular asset doesn't mean it's a good idea. Think independently and make decisions based on your research and goals. Seven, regularly review and rebalance. This helps to ensure your portfolio aligns with your goal. Rebalance by buying or selling assets to maintain your desired asset allocation. Eight, fees matter. High fees can eat into your returns. Look for low-cost investment options like index funds or ETF, especially for long-term investments. Nine, passive investing is effective. You can automate your investments, prioritizing funds over individual stocks, allowing you to set it and leave it. This approach helps prevent impulsive reactions to short-term market fluctuations. 10. It's normal to make some investment mistakes and there is a lot to learn from them. So stay patient, think long-term. Remember that investing is a journey and there is no one-size-fits-all strategy. Thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe to our show, leave a rating, and don't forget to explore the show notes for additional information and valuable resources.